Welcome to Your Money Momentum, a podcast delivering information on personal financial planning, investing, and wealth management. Hosted by Global Wealth Advisors Tom Kennedy and Kevin M. Curley II, this show will feature market discussions, strategy, and practical advice aimed at building momentum with your money. Learn more and subscribe today at gwadvisors.net slash podcast. And now, here are certified financial planner professionals, Tom and Kevin. All right. Welcome, everyone. You're listening to Your Money Momentum. My name is Tom Kennedy, and I have Kevin Curley here. And today we are going to discuss a topic that is comes up quite a bit, constantly in the news. It's college planning. The title for it is Don't Pay the Sticker Price for College. Uh, so we'll talk about some 529 strategies. Then we'll go into our seven toss-up questions. So Let's jump into it. Kevin, what's going on? Got my flag shirt ready for 4th of July. Going to go see some fireworks. Um, you know, feeling patriotic, Tom. So let's talk about college. One of the things about being a patriotic American is knowing that we have the best higher education system in the world. Now, people can compete with our high schools, our elementary schools, but no one on earth competes with our colleges. And people come from all over the world to attend them. So it's a pretty competitive thing. And unfortunately, in the last 30 years, it's gotten really really expensive but there's this little secret that uh almost nobody's paying uh full sticker price for college so we're going to run through a couple examples uh, but i'd start with vanderbilt university um, which we'll have later in our toss-ups and we'll see who's paying attention but if you make less than one hundred fifty thousand dollars as a household you're paying almost no tuition to attend vanderbilt so and that's a school that costs almost a hundred thousand dollars a year so when we say don't pay for sticker price there's a lot of ways not to pay for sticker price so we'll go through a couple of those things, but I want to start with just a couple of ways to save, and then we'll go through what we'll call the secrets of how to get discounted tuition. Yeah, let's let's ju- let's jump into it. And by the way, before we do, let's what what does college cost right now? So you got Ivy League schools are averaging seventy eight thousand a year. Uh, private four year on campus is fifty five thousand. Public four year on campus is forty four, and public four year in state is 27. So those are those are the prices and those are those are only going up. So let's, let's jump into it. Yeah, it's a lot is the the short answer. And the place people really get hurt a lot is that they have multiple kids. And usually those kids tend to be pretty close in age, just the way that we say human biology works, Uh, you're gonna have maybe 13 years of education to play for, and it's gonna happen in 13 consecutive years, all at once. And oh, by the way, you're gonna want to retire maybe 10 years after they all go to college. So planning ahead helps. So the first thing to do is just to actually save. Uh, so putting money in a 529 is a really smart vehicle because you go in there in some states you get a state deduction from your tax return uh, and others like texas where we have no state income taxes no deduction but there's still tremendous advantage because each year you're not going to pay capital gains or any taxes as that money grows and as long as you take it out uh, and use it for eligible college expenses so tuition and fees room and board books even a computer uh you pay no taxes. And so when we look at plans for people and we say, okay, well, we need $100,000 to save. If they start when the child is a newborn, that may only be tens of thousands of dollars because of the growth in the market that we anticipate, as opposed to if your kid's a freshman in college, we don't have any time for that money to compound. So the earlier, the better. Uh, and putting in a 529 in a tax advantage way uh, is really a tremendous help. Yeah. And there's been, um, especially with the new, you know, secure act 2.0, there's a, there's a lot more flexibility. You can use it, um, for, for K through 12. Uh, and you know, you can use up to, I believe it's 10,000 if you're, if your kid's going to private school. Um, you know, one big question that we get a lot is not, not a lot because most people don't have this issue of overfunding, but sometimes, you know, you start with, you start with a good amount and you don't know how much college is going to be. And, your kid gets a scholarship or gets grants, which we'll get into, but you're left with money in that 529. And one of the the new rules they're allowing is to roll that money out into a Roth IRA uh, for your child, which is huge. And also, you can also change the beneficiaries on those 529. So if your kid doesn't use it, you can pass it on to the next kid or grandchildren, et cetera. Yeah. And so that's really great information. And that's a great place to start. And if you're interested in seeing one of those plans and setting one up, Tom and I can definitely help you with that. But where we want to kind of shift is a lot of people have heard about 529s and other types of savings accounts. What they probably haven't heard is how much you can save by being clever in your application, as well as depending on which school you go to, just taking advantage of scholarships. So let's let's jump into there. So the first thing you got to do is you've got to fill out the FAFSA form. 
Um, even if you're a wealthy family and you say, I'm not going to qualify for fin any financial aid, uh, in order to qualify for all this other type of aid that schools give, you got to fill it out. It's just the rule. So <laughs> go ahead and do that as a starting point. Um, and then from there, you can start doing some research. And one of the first things you want to do is go on the College Board website and start looking for the cost of attendance. So COA. Uh, and then you want to look for something else called the uh, net cost. And they'll so all be listed. Some schools, they put them on their own website, really easy to find. Other times you got to go on College Board and actually find it because they are a nice aggregator of all that information. Uh, and you got to figure out the schools that you're applying to, are they merit-based aid or are they need-based aid? So all the Ivy League schools and probably most of the top 50, but not all of them, 100% uh, of me need is met. So if you apply and you get in and you demonstrate a need through your FAFSA application, you get to go for pay whatever you can afford to pay. Uh, other schools do the opposite, which is merit-based. So let's say you have a pretty bright kid and they can get awarded scholarships. Um, you know, that that's one way to go. So I went on for a minute. I want to let Tom jump in, but I've got a lot to say. <laughs> No, no, keep, 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 keep going. This okay, is good. So I'll give you an example, University of Alabama. Um, and this website, I mean, this stuff is available online. If you go look it up on their website or college board. So many state schools and Alabama is a great example because they do rolling admissions. So if you apply in, let's say August, you might get in by August 15th and find out you qualify for something. So for example, if your student has between a 32 and a 36 on the ACT or a 1420 to 1600 on the SAT, and had a 3.5 GPA in high school, they automatically get the presidential scholarship at the Universal University of Alabama, which is worth $28,000 a year. So that covers tuition. It's done. It's taken care of. It's completely done. Let's say yeah. your kid is uh, pretty bright, but not as bright. They have different levels of University of Alabama Scholar, a Foundation of Excellence, a Capstone, all the way down to Crimson Legends, who you need a 1,200 on the SAT and a 3.5, and they'll give you $6,000 a year. And you don't have to do anything except let them know I qualify for the scholarship. It's automatically given. Uh, so it's a great way for anybody, whether it's in state or out of state, to go to a school like this and pay a significantly discounted rate for a very smart student. Kevin, where are we where where are we pulling these slides from too? And by the way, anyone that wants these slides or more information, you can reach out to us because it's going to be a lot of information. But it is really, really, really good. And I'm sure there's a consolidated website where you can pull all this information from all different types of yeah. schools. Yeah. So correct? there's a service called College Age uh, College Aid Pro uh, and you can go on there. I recently was in a webinar with a guy who runs it or works there, and he gave us a lot of this good information and you can go on there and you can sign up for their services. Um, in addition, you can work with Tom and I, and we can go and do it for you. Uh, and, you know, kind of, kind of get it done. If you want to, <laughs> if you want somebody else to do the work and you're an existing client, uh, we'll be happy to help. And if you're thinking about becoming a client, we can walk you through this, but this level of information is really helpful because what you can do is you go through their resources and they have this really great software and you go, well, I don't know where I want to go. Um, but I like this one school and it's all available for you. And so you can go and figure out your own net costs for your specific situation. So, um, you know, let me pause and ask Tom a couple questions just to see where we stand for kind of the state of things. So Tom, merit-based scholarships and need-based scholarship grants. So this is free money, not loans. You have to pay out. What percentage do they pay of college right now? That's a good question. I don't 31 know. 31% of total college costs comes from merit-based scholarships and need-based grants. And a grant is free money. So that, that's pretty good. So one reason the college uh, sticker price is not something you need to mess with is a third of it's getting paid by free money. Uh, in addition, Tom, I'll ask wow. you a follow-up question, which is private colleges have a lot more leniency because they can kind of do whatever they want. Uh, what do you think the average tuition discount is for a private college? I would say 20%. 56.2%. So more than half wow. off that sticker price that you saw. So I've had clients come in and, you know, we're in Texas. So I'll just use a couple examples, SMU, but Baylor is a really great example because they do merit-based aid. So people say, ah, we're not going to Baylor. It's $68,000 a year. I'm not going to pay that. They can go to, you know, Texas A&M or something like that. And depending on the kid, it might be cheaper for them to go to Baylor than it is for them to go to the state school. Whether it's tech, whether it's A&M, wow. whether it's Texas, Whichever, whichever flag you like to fly in your house, you might be surprised to find out that these private colleges, because of the way they're set up with their endowments and some of the things they give to kids, uh, it can be cheaper to go. So uh, pretty helpful. Uh, the other thing is finding free money once you actually apply. So if you have a pretty bright student, let's say they can qualify to go to an Ivy League school, uh, great for them. Uh, they're going to cover 100% of any need. 
not really going to have any merit. And the reason why is everybody who gets in probably had a 1600 or close, may have been valedictorian. Uh, we're talking about schools like Stanford, like Yale, like Harvard, the really kind of top of the top as far as academics go and rejection rates go. Not a lot of free money there. But if you go, let's say the U.S. News World Report, and you go, all right, I'm just get the first 20 because they're not going to give me any money. And you start getting a 28, 29, 30, especially in the top 50 in that schools, they're going to be really excited for your student that got into Stanford to come to their university instead. And they will make it very worth your while. So talking to the admissions department about financial aid, you say, okay, who do I need to talk to? They'll tell you, okay, here's the person who makes the decisions. Here's how this committee works. And here's what you need to demonstrate. So you go through, show them the need. And if there's no need, you say the merit. Go, look, I got into Stanford. I'd love to come to your school instead, but I need to see $25,000 per year. And shockingly, Tom, these schools all find the money for the right student. Yeah. They will find the money. So really, really great ways to cut the cost of college pretty quickly. So uh, when you go on their websites, you can find out who meets needs, who meets merit, uh, a really quick way to do that. The other thing is to pit schools against each other. So again, this won't really work if you're going to Stanford or Harvard or one of the, you know, kind of 3% acceptance rates where the yield is almost 100% of people who get in and just go. Uh, for everybody else though, if you go to go that mid tier, you say, I really wanna go to X university uh, and you apply, but instead of just applying to that one, you apply to four other schools just like it. And then you go back to them and say, hey, I got into all five of these schools. I'd really love to come to yours, but can you find me a few thousand dollars more off tuition per year. And I would say almost always they come back and go, Tom, we'd love to have you as a student. We found that $5,000 you were asking for. Yeah. And it's, it's amazing how many people don't do that. It's like any other, it's like anything else with, with negotiating. Um, like you said, you know, people, they want their attendance. They want to get people in the school and they'll, they'll discount it to, to make that happen. Mm -hmm. So the last thing I'll say, and this, you know, we could spend an hour on each of these sections that we're just kind of highlighting. So if you want to go in more in depth, just let us know. But the last thing is, um, we'll say being very clever. So there's a thing called income shifting, which basically means that your kids can go work for you or just kind of work in general, and they can become their own person, uh, no longer your dependent. That could really ratchet up their opportunity to get an increase in how much aid they're allowed or how much savings they have. So I had somebody tell me once that they got their kid apartment, they got their driver's license in their state, and you know they only had to pay out-of-state tuition for the first year or so, and then they were an in-state resident, and the student was living on their own, they had their own income, and now they qualified for a huge break from that one. Um, in addition to that, if you have your own business, which we work with a lot of business owners, I know Tom does, you can hire your own kids, and you can get them their own tax returns and their own income, and then at that point, if they're no longer claimed as dependents, when they go to apply for school, what's their income look like, Tom? Yep, that's exactly right. It's going to be much, much, much lower. How much lower, credits are they um, available as, for? It's, it's all the credits. So um, there, yep. there's a lot of ways to do that. So, you know, a lot of these strategies are going to be targeted at affluent families and ones who are pretty well off. And so we understand that. Um, beyond that, there's a ton of grants, tons of aids, tons of loan opportunities as well. Uh, but being smart with lending is something to do. Uh, if we want to spend just a minute or two on loans, Tom, and then we can uh, jump into toss up. Yeah, let's do it. So a lot of different types of loans. Uh, <laughs> there's federally subsidized loans. There's plus loans. There's private loans. Uh, some are need based. Many of them are not need based. Uh, what I would tell you is uh, you can give your kids some skin in the game by having a loan, but it's going to be a real drag on their net income and their ability to build wealth after college if they're spending a lot of time paying off loans, especially if it's a lot of loans and it might take 20, 25 years to pay off. Even if somebody with a high salary that maybe got it from graduate school, you know, those loans might stick with them until their forties. Uh, so uh, <laughs> I'll take your hot takes on loans real quick. Yeah, no, I think, you know, when you combine that too, if you have money set aside, like a 529 plan as well, we find out a lot of time that you just don't have enough so, so that the child has to take a loan. And what I would recommend is using that 529 money for later on. It allows a couple more years of growth. They can take a loan out for the first couple of years. Most of the time, the interest doesn't start accruing. Um until after they graduate, there's different types of loans, different types of interest rates, but it's like shopping out any other loan. Um, there's there's a ton out there. Uh, you can even use 529 money now, uh, I think up to 10,000 to pay off uh, college loans when when they graduate. But I agree with you. I think that have it, 
had them having some skin in the game makes makes a lot of sense um and there's a lot of different strategies that go go around uh to it and there's not it's not black and white everyone's different everyone's in a different position and um there's probably it's like social security there's a lot more strategies than you think are out there and uh, i definitely recommend getting with someone to talk yeah about. and the last thing i would say is just there's no normal when it comes to paying for college <laughs> every family we meet yep. with they have different numbers of kids different philosophies on types of school, different majors they're willing and not willing to pay for, money they want to leave to the kids if they go to cheaper schools versus more expensive schools. So if you think, oh, what's normal? There is no normal. There's no, here's what everybody does. There's your unique situation and it takes a thoughtful plan and a good course of action to make sure you maximize the free money that's out there and you know make sure your kid gets the best education they can. Yeah, and by the way things are going, colleges might be free anyway for everybody. So we'll see. <laughs> yeah. Just had, to, just had to throw that in there. Yeah, we'll see. I don't think Bernie's on the ticket this year, but who knows who takes up that banner <laughs> next. All right, Tom. So we move over to toss-up? Let's do All it. Right. All right. So uh, let's start with this one. So, Tom, these first couple, we're going to stay on topic here with college. So degrees are tied to lifelong higher earnings, and in some cases the value of the degree extends – to the network created at the universities beyond just the hard skills learned in the classroom. Parents often are pleased and sometimes surprised at how much their kid has grown in the four years while attending school. So toss up, main value of college is classwork, networks or time, or is it about maturity for late adolescence? You know, I think it, it, it varies. Um, if you're, if you're, if your kid is going to a college where they know what they want to do, you know, maybe they want to be an engineer. So they're going to go to the Colorado school of mines, or they want to be in the medical field. So they're going to go to John Hopkins. I think those type of programs that are more granular and specific, they're going to probably get more out of the actual classwork, but for the majority, no one, no one knows, uh, at least for the first couple of years on, on what, what they want to do. And I think also one good strategy too, is going to community college for the first couple of years, get the electives out of the way, transfer into school, it cuts down on costs, and they can kind of figure out what, what they want to do in those two-year time periods. But I think it's a combination. I think, you know, we would all agree when kids come back from college, they're different um, for, for you know, good <laughs> or bad. They come um, back definitely different. Def That's definitely different. Every Everyone grows up in, in different ways, um, but the networks, that's an interesting one. You know, you go to Ivy League, to get into an Ivy League school, I mean, you are you are set for life. Some of some of those Ivy League schools, the programs, the networks that they have, I mean, you can get a job in any industry, you know, in, indefinite with just, just those networks. But even outside the Ivy Leagues, you know, being able to network um, is, is huge. I mean, you see schools like Texas A&M, mm -hmm. which have massive, massive networks, and it's it's helpful. People get jobs and 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 uh, are able to do that through through their networking through college. So I think all three of them are valuable. Yeah, I, uh, I won't answer because I was just going to say all of them, which you ultimately did. So pretty easy to do there. Well, well, let's see if Tom... I don't know what you guys have at Villanova besides basketball. We have a pretty but, good business uh, school uh, for a long time. We used to have a great accounting <laughs> school. Now nobody majors in accounting anymore. So I don't know what that's going to look like in five years. Either. I don't, I don't let's see if Tom is paying right, attention uh, to this next question. I got one more for you, Tom. Let's see if you were paying attention the first half. So Vanderbilt's cost of entering freshman engineers is $98,426. However, families with less than $150,000 in income uh, pay no tuition in most instances. So toss up using the published cost of attendance to determine college costs or using the net cost of attendance. Net cost of attendance. There you go. Come on. <laughs> I was paying attention. I got to make sure our listeners uh, heard the first part. Maybe they fast forward and didn't want to hear about college. We got to, hey, you need to rewind and go listen. We had some great things in there. That is pretty amazing, though. I, I didn't know that it's until you so talked about it Find me a earlier. sale like that where you get the same value. Usually it's stuff that's on clearance because they don't want it anymore. It's garbage. But you get the same degree, we get it for half the price. Uh, yep. All right, Kevin. Well, let me give you, uh, let me give you one. Um, Let's do uh, a company based in Shanghai did a productivity study of 1,600 on their employees to determine if hybrid work was effective as full-time in or in office. They found that no drop-off in productivity, promotions, or general success of employees working three days in the office, two days remote, versus five days in the office. Uh, let's see. Hybrid working 
or full time in the office? What do you prefer? Yeah, it's not even a preference. It's a fact that hybrid working works really well. It leads to happier employees. It leads to more success um, for them staying longer. Uh, and we've seen through this research that the productivity does not drop off. So I do think there's value to being together and meeting in person and being in the office as a person with young kids. Sometimes you literally cannot work from home <laughs> because it's too chaotic. Uh, the harder part of this is where is it appropriate to take these video calls and participate in meetings? So I was recently on a flight to Philadelphia and we had a meeting, um, with one of our groups and, you know, it was important that I participate, but I was on an airplane. So I took the meeting on there. I had my headphones and it seemed fine, but we've seen situations for a long time. He worked from coffee shops, but more popular now is, uh, primarily women, uh, are taking their calls from hair salons and nail salons. And Tom, I guess I put it back to you. Hybrid working is great. Productivity doesn't drop off, but do you need to be sitting at home like you uh, might be today and saying, okay, well, I can take this call from here really easily, or is it all right to get your hair done and uh, <laughs> get ready for your night out during a, during a, a team call? No, we, we've all called some kind of service desk and you hear babies crying, dogs barking. I think it's one, it depends on the person um, and them being able to actually have the discipline to work from home. And we know all, you know, we know there's people that just can't do it. And also from a, from a managerial standpoint, it's extremely difficult to manage uh, people that work remotely because you don't know what they're doing. It's harder to keep pulse on it. And then some industries, you obviously just can't work, re work remotely. But I think there is a place for it. My wife does it. She's effective with it. But I know some folks that, that do work from home and they're not doing much, much at all. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, mean, look, I don't think it newspaper articles about companies who track like how much mouse movement is and keyboard. And they found people were faking it, just moving the mouse down every now and then. Uh, and they fired them, which they probably should because they're getting compensated and not doing any work. So <laughs> if you're going to sit there and just move a mouse around, you might as well just work. <laughs> <laughs> that seems like just more work than, than probably the, the job yeah. at hand. What's that bird that always kind of goes down? Maybe he's, you know, just, yeah, he's it. just hitting the num lock <laughs> and the caps lock repeatedly. So it looks like you're putt typing. That's pretty but... funny. All right, Tom, the next one, uh, <laughs> Fed governor, of Minneapolis, Neil Kashgar recently suggested he hated inflation more than a recession, which is important as we talk about Fed cuts. This comes as anecdotal evidence that late, low wage workers were able to handle a recession better than inflation as they could rely on family and their personal networks to survive a recession, but inflation hurt their entire network. So toss up, which is worse, inflation or recessions? This is, this is, this is so dumb it, that that's like saying, you know, what do you hate worse cancer or a car crash? I mean, it's just, it doesn't, there's no, I don't even understand like in, inflation's bad, but if you think recession, you think inflation is worse than a recession, maybe you haven't been through some recessions. You have unemployment rates spike up uh, to people are getting laid off. I mean, it's, it, they're, they're nasty and they can, they can, they can be long lived. They can lead to depressions. <laughs> Inflation is tough too. I mean, we're all experiencing it right now. Grocery bills are twice as what they were. Um, housing prices, auto insurance, et cetera. I don't see how one could be worse than the other. Um, and one typically leads to the other. So hopefully we don't experience the, the latter part, which is the recession. Um, but I don't see how you can differentiate the two. I think maybe they affect different you know, I don't even know if they do that. I was going to say maybe they affect different net worth families and, and different different class citizens. But I think we all feel we all feel inflation and we all definitely feel feel a recession. Yeah, to that end, there's a, an old joke about what's the difference between a recession and a depression. Uh, recessions when your neighbor loses his job, a depressions when you lose your job. And so, you know, the mm -hmm. thought that you can move in with a neighbor or family or friend, you can understand why people think they can survive that. But yeah, inflation hurts everybody. Uh, and it's a very blunt instrument. Yep. It hurts lower income people more um, because you see it in food prices and gas prices, all the things they need. Um, and inflation, when it hits needs, is particularly you know painful. If somebody doesn't get to go on vacation, I think they'll live. But if they can't afford groceries or their gas bill, we have a major, major problem. Yep, yep. All right. Um, I saw this one on here. I don't know how to answer it, Kevin. So I'm going to throw it Great. to you. Uh, the pandemic showed me efficiency of mRNA treatments for diseases. Companies like Moderna and BioNTech discovered this accident while their main goal was treating cancer. Recently, Moderna started a phase three trial for treating melanoma, which is successful, would prove the efficiency of mRNA in treating more types of cancers. So the toss-up is traditional cancer treatments 
or mRNA cancer treatments? Yeah, I, I think that it's really fascinating research. I don't know if it's going to work. They're in phase three trials, like you said, but the mRNA cancer treatments could be, we'll say, a much nicer way to treat cancer. If you think about traditional cancer treatments, it involves surgery, it involves cutting things out, involves poisoning yourself with chemo. Uh, it's very unpleasant, but it you know has success rates. Uh, this mRNA cancer treatment, you're talking about getting shots, alternating, altering your DNA through mRNA uh, to make tumors go away and then make you resistant to that in the future. I mean, if it works, this is uh, world changing. I mean, we talk about for 40 years, how do we solve cancer? I can't remember if it was Nixon, I think, you know, put the first, you know, U.S. government effort on that. You know, that was in the 70s. Here we are 50 years later and we're trying to still work on it. So if this turns out to be a great thing, uh, it'd be tremendous to say, OK, well, now. And it only works so far on some of the uh, different types of tumors. But if they figure that one out, I got to believe they'll figure out the next one and then the next one. So uh, it's nice, I guess, that the efficacy looks like it's working. And maybe all that money that Moderna and BioNTech got during COVID will go to R&D to solve cancer. And they go, all right, well, it wasn't all a waste of time. Yeah, you know, it's, um, you know, everyone knows someone who's been through chemo. And if, if you're lucky enough to survive it, I mean, sometimes your life's changed indefinitely. Mm -hmm. I just found out actually this week that uh, when you go through chemo, you have to keep your, your hands and your feet cold. Um, if you don't, you could actually lose all uh, sensitivity permanently in, in your hands and feet, um, which I, I never knew. I mean, there's, you know, knock on wood. I mean, it's the, the, the chemotherapy is just terrible. We all, we all know that. So yeah, if there's a better, better way to do it. Um, I mean, these biotech companies are making headways big time, um, just with helping out with symptoms and going through chemo. So, um, hopefully, hopefully it shows some, so, so some, uh, some efficiency. Yeah. All right. Well, let me throw you the next one, which is, uh, I think it's a fun one, uh, but it can get a little political. So be careful with your answer, I guess, but, uh, growth in Eurozone wages were up 4.7% in the third quarter of last year and four and a half percent in the fourth quarter. However, European companies like Volkswagen can't find workers. Uh, there's really only two options to solve this problem. Either the current workers got to be more productive or they're going to need some immigration because they don't have enough. Uh, recently, a Japanese robotics company's Fanuc is starting to see more European demand as low birth rates and labor shortages cause problems on the assembly line. So, Tom, here's the toss up. How are you going to solve this problem? Are you going to have more immigrants or more robots? <laughs> yeah, this is a load. <laughs> well, I, 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 let me. Uh, let me start with this. Um, you know, you look at the the growth in the labor force and the productivity, it's just been going down. And I think that trend's going to continue with the baby boomers retiring. I think it's, you know, up to 15,000 15, a day retiring. Um, so how are we going to replace that? I don't think the, 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 the solution is using immigrants. I'm all about the robots. Robots don't use up healthcare. They don't, we don't have to worry about them paying taxes or not. Um, so I think the efficiencies are going to be on the robotic side. Yeah, I, I think I would probably agree with you. And what I'd cite is China has a ratio of 322 robotic units. So arms doing stuff for every 10,000 employees back in 2021. So they have massive adoption. I think that there's places like the United States where we still have some manufacturing and some's coming back uh, and Europe as well, where you can see massive adoption of robotics. And then the last piece, I mean, you look at Japan. They, they have a robot that flips pancakes. They got robots that you know do all kinds of things. So I think that this will be a really powerful trend. Uh, maybe after AI settles down, the, the most exciting investment will be uh, robotics companies, but we're not there yet. Yeah, I think that... I think there's there's a, a McDonald's. I don't know where it is, but it's it's fully mm -hmm. robotic operated. Yeah. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Automated but, probably yeah, is the There's word. not a human... <laughs> automated. Yeah. Yeah, robotics. There's yeah. not a... <laughs> there, there's not a... There's not a human being in there and it's probably really efficient. And you, I bet when you get the hamburger, it's not the, the bun isn't halfway off the patty <laughs> and the pickles are all over the place. I bet it's like prestige. Yeah. The thing about not using people is it's more consistent in many cases. All right. Well, last one. So, uh, the dollar, been a lot of talk about the dollar, U S debt running away, losing the status as the global reserve currency. I feel like this is just an ongoing conversation. It has declined from 65% of reserves down to 58 from 2016, 2023 Euro has picked up their slice. Gold is around 10% and rising. Uh, even the Chinese currency has gone from 0% to 2.3% of, uh, reserves. So the toss up is, 
if you're if you're a, a foreign central bank, uh, what's your asset allocation look like? You're using dollars, euros, gold, crypto. Yeah, I uh, I think that at least most of it's still going to be in dollars. It's the uh, world's reserve currency for now. It continues to be powerful. I think the spending could get out of control and cause some problems. Uh, I definitely have some euros in there, some yen even maybe uh, a lot of gold and. I see your Michael Lewis book back there. I read it last week. Um, you know, no, none of them have adopted that yet. I'm not a big believer in it, but I think that if that starts to happen and you see a lot of alternatives as part of central banks, uh, that would be interesting. But the gold one's the most interesting in the last couple of years because we've seen since uh, all the sanctions that happened to Russia because of their invasion, uh, everybody else says we got to own some gold because you can trade oil, you can trade the gold, but if you can't access the euros and the dollars because you've been sanctioned, uh, that puts you in a really tight spot. So you never know when you're going to fall out of favor with an ally or somebody who's not an ally. Uh, so I'm, I'm diversifying if I'm a foreign central bank. Yeah, and it, 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 it's cyclical. I mean, you look at in the early 2000s, it was the peak. You know, the, the, the dollar made up 70% of the global, global uh, reserve. You know, 30 years ago, it was 50%. And to your point, you know, post-wars, you know, it typically goes down because of sanctions and stability, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, it'll be – I don't think you should be all or one. It should be diversified just, just like anything else. Um, but I do – this de-dollarization de has – been going on for for years and i don't think it ever i don't think it goes away anytime soon yeah i mean it's still the the biggest house on the street the safest bank and the uh, <laughs> the ones getting robbed but uh, well there's there's something called the uh, rule of law which a lot of countries have having, have. having grasped that concept just just quite well you yet. also have so, the, the uh, free float i mean if you look at the chinese currency you have tons of capital controls and it's pegged to the dollar with a very tight range so we don't really know what it's worth and they could devalue overnight and suddenly those reserves you have can't get you all the things you thought it could. And, and just to put it in perspective, 88% of all foreign currency transactions is in, is dominated in, in US dollars, which is at mm -hmm. its peak. So uh, again, I don't see it going anywhere. It can't, cryptocurrency comes up a lot. It, one of the main things of having a, a reserve is stability. And you're not, you're obviously not seeing that in, in cryptocurrency. I know <laughs> we're not allowed to say that word on, on the podcast, we but yeah. <laughs> Michael oh, Lewis's just book about alternative stuff. Oh, that that was your that was your. I was wondering why you I can see it in the background there, but I read it last week. I you know the thing, and I'm gonna finish with this, which is just I don't understand what he was doing. He made all this money arbitraging when he stole the idea from the high frequency traders at Jane Street and other firms, and he's making hundreds of millions of dollars. And he goes, Ah, oh, you know what I should do? I should get into the brokerage game. And you go, Okay, and then it goes terrible. He could have just made several hundred million dollars for a few years, and then. You know, do whatever you want, but he was determined to. Well, he, he, he got all of his backing by the what effective was it? Altruist. The uh, the EA, the effective altruist, yeah. which is just a crazy concept. But Flash Boys is another good one right, to read one. if you haven't. Yeah, read that, that one. one. I you know, my only disappointment in that one is he never actually figured out, other than spoofing and front running clients, how they were making money. Um, so to me, it seems like he was expecting more from that, but. Nobody made a peep. Nobody, there was no regulatory changes. There was that one exchange that was in that book, but I mean, I guess maybe we'll have the text exchange at some point, but it just seems to me that uh, they're just front running. So I don't, I don't have an answer. Yeah. For those of you that want some good books, Michael Lewis, in my opinion, anything is uh, are good, good, quick, easy reads and he dumbs it down. And if you're not in finance, um, he's got a lot of books on, on different, different things that have happened over you the like years. like narrative so. nonfiction, whether it's history or politics or in this case, markets. It's great. He's got one about baseball. Yeah. He's got a lot of stuff. But uh, yeah, the markets one for guys in our career, uh, real helpful. So, are you grabbing your I'm stack? You have to turn my. I'm about to read this one. That one. <laughs> oh, the fifth risk. I haven't read that. One. Have you read Panic? Nope, haven't read Panic. Good one. Um, I got that one, and then I got this one, the Undoing Project. I've done that one. That one was a little tougher to go through because uh, it's about the guys, nice. and they allude to the behavioral economics. Uh, it wasn't necessarily about the behavioral economics. So he talked about their theories, but didn't go like into the theories. It was really about the two guys, which is still interesting. But um, yeah. All right. Well, great talk, Tom. Yeah, well, uh, we'll see the Maybe we can section. start a book club. Yeah. Join us for our next episode where we go through summer reading. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kevin. You've been listening to Your Money Momentum brought to you by Global Wealth Advisors. To learn more about GWA and its talented roster of financial professionals, head on over to gwadvisors.net. Thanks, and we'll see you next time on Your Money Momentum.
All indices are unmanaged and investors cannot invest directly into an index. Certain sections of this commentary contain forward-looking statements that are based on reasonable expectations, estimates, projections, and assumptions. Forward-looking statements are not guarantees of future performance and involve certain risks and uncertainties, which are difficult to predict. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Diversification does not assure profit or protect against loss in declining markets.